Dobri dan. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Biana Jotic and Jelena Perac for hosting this exhibition. And especially also Jasna Jovanov, uh, who I first made contact with about three years ago um, as I began, well, I began much earlier, writing the biography of Ila. And I had to understand what was the art scene here in Belgrade at the time in the 20s. And going through Google, obviously, I found Jasna, and also I found um, Bojana Popovic, who had written articles. And um, so I began a three-year email conversation with, with uh, Jasna. And she was very helpful to find information, which uh, <clears throat> helped with my book, <clears throat> obviously. And also, more recently, Gordana Kristic uh, wrote an article about Ila's time in Paris and somewhat in America. So I thank you all. You may know that Ila lived here for about five years between the ages of 15 and 20. 1926 to 31, approximately. And she, was, she, she gained a certain success in what she was doing. Um, she got a, um, a commission for a bas relief sculpture for a new cinema. And then she did a sculpture, which she entered into the uh, third full exhibition uh, in 1930. And um, based on a photograph of herself, this Photograph is not in the exhibition, but it's in the catalog. And the actual uh, sculpture is right here. So she had to leave. Her visa expired, and she went to Paris. And um, I, should, I should mention that I am, uh, she, she was my godmother, I should mention. And uh, so I obviously heard a lot about her growing up. And one thing my mother said when I interviewed her a few decades ago for this, for my biography, she basically, my mother basically said, Ila arrived in Paris believing she would conquer the world. She felt so big here when she got to Paris. She thought the Paris is hers. It didn't quite work out that way immediately. So what I'd like to begin with is what Ela sounded like, her presence. And um, what was her speech like? And I'm very lucky that there was uh, a man named Roger Klein, a close friend of hers, who I interviewed. And he had written a fairy tale-like uh, essay about her. Roger was a journalist. Um, he parted a lot among sculptors. He was a good friend of Henry Miller. They lived in the same hotel. And years after Ila died, Roger wrote this fairy tale essay that begins like a fairy tale. Quote, once upon a time, a young girl from Central Europe arrived in Paris. So Roger found Ila's unidiomatic French grammar and syntax both unique and comically confusing. She was cheerful and had both a contagious laugh and a verb that came to mind upon reading a description of a Polish refugee in, in a French novel. Now, this is the quote that he wrote. And this comes from the French novel, <clears throat> actually. There was something impetuous and unexpected in her manner that made her more piquant than she would have been naturally. One observed her with interest and curiosity, as if watching a magnificent thunderstorm. She spoke several languages, imperfectly, it is true, but always vivaciously and sometimes with grace. Her ideas seemed to emerge through these hurdles all the more pleasing, fresh and naive, for foreign idioms rejuvenate thoughts by freeing them from commonplace or affected forms of expression. That's 
from that book describing this Polish refugee. Um, overall, Roger considered Ela's curious way of speaking not so much a massacring of French, but a charming embellishment of the language. Now, <clears throat> so Il was born in Vienna, so she spoke German. She went to a German boarding school in Budapest, so she also learned Hungarian, and she probably spoke some Serb with her mother. So here she is um, in Belgrade, and I can imagine that uh, here in Belgrade, people here also uh, experience a magnif magnificent thunderstorm because she's grappling with these different languages, trying to express herself. Um, and I would like to share several other comments from close friends who assisted Ela in her studio and at pet shows. These would be dog and cat pet shows that she would go to to photograph the animals there and possibly use them uh, for commercial uses. In New York, Ela needed help obtaining model releases to use these photos commercially in advertising. One friend said that Ela recognized that her curt manner, together with her strong accent, very funny voice, and strange laugh, often irritated people, a laugh that could pierce walls, as described by another assistant. Another friend remarked that at the cinema, when Ela laughed, the whole audience would turn to look at her. Laughing at her laugh, it was funnier than the Harold Lloyd film they were watching. She always had an incredible sense of humor, a sense of comedy. And even when she spoke of problems in her life, she always spoke with a sense of humor for she always laughed. Now, Ela had great strength and determination. Around 1935, she visited London to photograph at the London Zoo and to meet publishers. Uh, another person uh, remarked, every morning, the person she was staying with there, every morning she would venture out and go from one editor's office to another despite speaking hardly a word of English. She so easily succeeded because she was so insensitive that she could do anything. Her astonishing success was the direct result of sheer determination and courage. I doubt if the possibility of shocking people ever occurred to her. She would talk of the most intimate subjects anywhere as naively as a child and in her penetrating voice. There was always an element of surprise about her. You never knew what she would say next. Indeed, Ela was fearless and knew no limits. Nothing stopped her. She was at ease with everybody and, could she, and she could see anybody and was accepted immediately. Ela did not respect traditional barriers. She was so natural with people and her approach to work incredibly self-assured and completely unselfconscious, to the extent that, quote, she could have entered the presidential palace in order to photograph the president of France and nobody would have stopped her. She would have managed. That's a strong woman. Now, <clears throat> I expect that people often asked Ela why she chose to photograph animals. After all, Almost the, all the photographers at the time, this would be in Paris, were photographing people. So Ela at one point decided to put her answer in writing. These are her own words, written around 1939. They were unpublished. <clears throat> in general, when one speaks of an animalist, one calls to mind someone who has chosen to paint, sculpt, or photograph animals rather than landscapes, humans, or still lives. I am not sure whether this term applies to me, for in truth, it is rather the animals that chose me. I became an animal photographer without thinking of making photography my, my profession, nor animals my favorite victims. 
And then she explains where she belongs within the animal kingdom. <clears throat> Just as certain beings are human because they are surrounded by, effortlessly mixed with, and are one with their own kind, I am animal because I always feel I am in a natural state with animals, which is not always the case, far from it, with the beings I resemble. When I find myself amongst cows or giraffes, for example, we are immediately entre nous. She's among her own kind. There's an unspoken understanding. Uh, <clears throat> now I'd like to speak about how charming Ela could be. And these are examples in writing. She was in Paris uh, for my first birthday while I was in New York. So she wrote a letter to my mother. To me, actually. I, she sent it to my mother. And she ends her letter as such. She's offering words of wisdom and advice. She says, as you're entering the best year of your life, be careful not to waste this best year on some worthless girl or uninteresting job. It's cute, no? Another example that she put in writing has to do with this book. Um, and what I'd like to do is, I mean, it deals specifically with this photograph. And what you can do is, you can pass around, you can pass around the photograph and what it's based on. And also, you have an example of her writing here because she never sent this letter. So you can pass this around. <clears throat> so uh, the English version, the, the original title of this book is They All Saw It. In French, it's Ils ont tous vu, vu. And this will be at the museum, so you can consult with this at some point if you want. So the story is this. The reader leafs through photos of various animals who have all been startled by something they have seen the reader only discovering the surprise on the next to last page, which is that photograph you'll see. Ela had an idea that this would be needed, wait, Ela had an idea what this would be, but needed to help to, re to realize this vision. Upon the suggestion of a friend, Ela wrote a letter to the photographer Ansel Adams. Now, in case you don't know, Ansel Adams uh, was very famous for photographing landscapes in western United States. And she's inquiring in her letter whether, with her characteristic humor, quote, this is from the letter, I want to ask you a big favor. <clears throat> Please, will you give me your moon and a little corner of your sky? I know men hate girls who ask for the moon, but my elephant needs it so badly. The enclosed rough montage is a proof that I'm not crazy. So she, didn't, she never sent that letter. She was referring to Adams's photograph, Moonrise, Hernandez, New Mexico, taken in 1941, <clears throat> which would eventually become his most recognized image. Now, during his lifetime, or uh, posthumously his estate, they printed up, there are at least a thousand photographs of this image from the negative. That's how popular it was. So, with great amount of retouching to her photograph to approximate the moon rise over clouds and snow-capped mountains, Ela ultimately created a photograph of a winged flying circus elephant, which you'll see there. Another example of her charm uh, is much later in India, towards the end of her trip in 1955, 
where she's being hosted by the Maharaja of Bharatpur. Um, she kept a diary during her trip, and excerpts from this diary were published in Animals in India. So, Ela discovered a forest with deer near the guest house where she was residing. She was drawn to the deer and felt compelled to photograph them. So we now witness, so we now witness the resistance she faced her determination to, provide, to prevail and succeed, and her delicate dance and way with men. Quote, The Maharaja of Bharatpur is certainly one of the nicest and most charming men I have ever met, <clears throat> completely disarming and most cordial. The Maharaja has a warmth and simplicity that are most endearing. When I wanted to photograph some deer in the forest, he said, do not disturb the deer. I said with surprise, but the government has given me permission to photograph them. Yes, he answered, but do please take your photographs from a considerable distance so they will not be disturbed. The deer will hardly be seen that way, I pleaded. Do not disturb them, he insisted. Couldn't we make them run? I asked. We don't want to see them only in a standing pose. He replied, the government orders that they not be disturbed. What is the activity of most deer in the forest? I asked, hoping to get him around to see my point. They graze, he said, and rest in the shade. Do they not sometimes run? I probed further. Yes, they do run. Do they die as the result of it? No, he said, they do not die. Then why should it be bad for them to run? Exercise will do them good. Aren't men stronger and healthier when they exercise? Yes, they are, he said. All right, you may go ahead. Um, I'd like to discuss a little bit about um, Nude photography, um, you already saw in the uh, catalog the nude outdoor photograph made in preparation for the sculpture of herself, which you have here, that was entered in the Autumn Salon of 1930. Around the same time, she also posed nude in a Belgrade photo studio. I have a portfolio of these photos but we have not been able to determine who the photographer or studio is. This is in Belgrade. Ela continued to model nude in Paris when she posed for her boyfriend, who painted her portrait outdoors by the sea during the summer of 1932. <clears throat> in 1933, she began to pose nude for her teacher, Ergie Landau, who photographed many of the photographs taken here in her studio. These were artistic nude photography sessions. She also modeled in the countryside for both Ergie and Nora Dumas, another student of Ergie. You see, modeling provided some extra income for Ela and for these photographers. So I know of at least 10 of these photos that were published in four or five magazines. And a lot of, most of the well-known or even lesser known photographers in Paris at the time, they were entering their photographs in all these magazines. That's how they you know, made some of a bit of a living. Now we come to New York. Ela's healthy body image and attitude towards nudity continued in New York, but in a casual manner. Her terrace in New York City provided the opportunity for her to indulge her passion for the sun, sunbathing nude. Even though she was surrounded by taller buildings and Rockefeller Center was just looking right down on her, from which she could be easily seen. <clears throat> A friend remarked when describing this activity, quote, she was very free. 
no hang-ups, little respect for other sense of propriety. I would speak, I'd like to speak a little bit, some comments about, this is from one of Ila's oldest friends uh, and photo agent in Paris regarding her relationships with men. Um, so Raymond said, in general, Ila's appeal was so irresistible, people were generally taken by her because she was absolutely natural, and she was attractive because she was extremely bright. Men always had a complex of inferiority with Ila because she was much more intelligent than we were. Perhaps what men found unsettling was she was independent and self-sufficient and could be aggressively honest and outspoken. With regard to Ila's private life, same person. With regard to Ela's life, Ela's private life over the span of her lifetime, of the men with whom Ela was intimate, only Jacques Klein, he was a playwright and brother of Roger who wrote that fairy tale, which I referred to earlier. Only Jacques Klein was the one to whom she was really submissive somebody she found superior to her. This is in 1937 or so, up until the war. Her relation with Jacques had a very sad ending. Jacques had been killed during the German assault of Rouen in June 1940. Ela was devastated and responded to Jacques' death with indignation rather than sorrow. She spoke of him in hateful tones. He died purposely, she claimed. It was all an effort to hurt her, she believed. Instinctively, she hit back at him to relieve her own pain, frantically attempting to soothe her own loss. Now, I'm wondering, I'm thinking that considering her extreme reaction, it is possible that the pain from this loss prevented Ela from entering another intimate relationship. Uh, I know of three other boyfriends she had in New York. None were at all of this nature. Um, although there was one who she was with for, was, uh, for about four years or so, five. Um, <clears throat> it was an on and off relationship. Um, this was Pierre Durand Ruel, who actually took that photograph. He was with her in Africa. I think there's another one he took here. His grandfather, Paul, built a reputation of Impressionist painters and introduced their market in the United States. He was filthy rich, and he gave uh, Ela spectacular gifts. And I think he was very helpful uh, to help fund her trip to Africa. He went to Africa with her. Um, and this was probably the most important uh, relationship she had, but as I said, it was off and on. He was, uh, he was an alcoholic, which didn't help. She couldn't stand up because her mother was an alcoholic. And also, he was uh, at, towards the end of a, of, a, of a marriage in France that was breaking up, so it was a very complicated situation. <clears throat> I described how Ela could be sweet and charming amongst her friends and acquaintances, but she could also be tough and difficult, very difficult, specifically when it came to publishing her books. <clears throat> One of her old friends, Frank Dobo, a literary agent who worked with Brassai and Henry Miller in Paris and worked with Ela in New York, he said, 
She was a stickler for quality. When she would go through the proofs of a book, she was just held to work with. Ela, as usual, was determined to prevail. So with this in mind, and out of respect for Ela's tastes and wishes, when I now make new prints, I use her publications as a guide for cropping and retouching. And I'd like to end with, um, I'd like to close with a very poetic piece, Ela Road, that was published in the book Animals in 1950. <clears throat> I have three ambitions. One realizable, two impossible. The first is to go to Africa and photograph whole herds of animals in their natural surroundings. Well, she did that. One of the impossible ones is to photograph mythical animals, the hippograph, the unicorn, the dragon, and all the other unknown animals who missed Noah's Ark. The other is the one dearest to me. I wish that a fairy would wave a wand and transport me for a month into the animal world in which each night or day for that whole magic month, I would be a different creature, a tiger, a fish, a bird, an insect. <clears throat> I would see the world of these creatures exactly as they see it. I would think their thoughts, feel their feelings, fight their battles, and understand their language. I would live their joys and their fears and their satisfactions. And then I would return to my human self and my human life, remembering with my human mind all that I had seen, thought, and felt. If this experience were possible to me, I think I would then be possessed of the beginnings of a real understanding of life. Thank you. Spasibo. Come on. Thank questions, you. questions, <laughs> questions. <laughs> Well, I mean, she mentions a few here. I can only go by what she wrote. This is what she wrote. So, so I, I, can't, I can't really add. She said hippogriff, unicorn. We know what a unicorn is. I'm not sure what a hippogriff is. And dragons. We've seen grad, dragons in a lot of mythological uh, uh, iconography from around the world. Please. Uh, you said something about uh, her Hungarian period. So, uh, do you know something more specific? specific? Where did she go to school? It was a German. It, it was yeah. It was a German boarding school in Budapest. Um, the original building doesn't exist. I think the school still does exist there. So, um, she was there. She, she got her. She did her high school uh, studies there. And at the end, she joined her mother here in Belgrade, who had a design gallery, interior design gallery, that uh, Boyana had written about. And uh, she, um, Ila was studying sculpture uh, in Budapest. And there are two photographs here, one where she's in her studio in Budapest, and one in her studio here in Belgrade. So she obviously had a uh, great interest in sculpture, and she needed to continue that. So she did leave her mark in Budapest. She what? She did leave her mark in Budapest. Um, I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say so. No, I mean, she did her schooling there. Uh, you say leave left a mark. I mean, I guess she, she made some sculptures there, but as with the ones here, their student sculptures, they just disappear. They disappear. I believe so. In fact, we have no... Uh, we have no evidence, uh, three-dimensional evidence, of what she did here either. Who knows? It might be somewhere. Uh, 
but um, we haven't come across that. Yes, I was five years old. Yeah. Uh, do you have some memories? Uh, not really. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, she took photographs of me every time she visited uh, my mother, probably almost as often as she could. So I have a portfolio of photographs. And it's difficult to say whether a photograph can revive a memory. But there is one photograph, probably the last one she took, I was, I guess, four years old. And somehow I have a memory of being on my mother's bed and playing with Ela's camera case. And there is a photograph of that. So I don't know if seeing the photograph has reminded me over the years. My grandmother always had that photograph on her desk in her home. Um, so I don't know if it's because of that. But you know, I remember there was this going on, and there was some conversation going on which I paid no attention to in the room. That's all. Storyteller. Well, she did both. Well, I, I can't. I shouldn't say she was a storyteller because when she had, when she wanted to do, a, I mean, she was basically famous for her children's books, and of course, in these children's books, there's a story being told. Now, what she says is that she had no preconceived idea. I mean, she decided she wanted to do a book with a squirrel. So there we have Tico Tico up on the wall, upper right. You have the squirrel. So, you know, she borrows the squirrel that lives with her. And she did with that squirrel that she did with other animals. It basically, um, it's, she, she, she makes play dates, interspecies play dates. She, knows she, she wants to get some action going. So she puts these different animals together and she lets them react to each other without any actual story in mind. Take, for instance, Tico Tico. It's, it's in English by one um, uh, writer. And in, in, in the United States, it's also published in English in England by Margaret Weiss Brown, another children's book writer. So there are two different stories with the same photos that basically have the same narrative, the same, they're, they're in the same Chronicle, not chronicle, they're in the same order in the book. So <clears throat> she basically had an idea that she wanted to work with a specific animal and um, just created these different scenes, these different uh, vignettes, and a story was created around that. Thank you. Anybody else? No? Thank you, Brian. Thank you.